so excited, <laughs> ladies and Jason. <laughs> oh hi! Oh, good to see our communities here. Oh, Katie is here. Oh, Katie is here. Nashi is here. Hi, so Shay. How are you? Welcome, Katie. Good to see you again. Two times in one day. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Thank you all for being here. We're just going to give about two minutes for everybody to get logged on before we go ahead and get started. We just ask that if you are not speaking for now, please keep yourself on mute just so we can control some noise before our panel officially begins. But we're happy to have you all here and hope everyone is off to a wonderful week so far. Yes, and uh, if some of our friends would like to say hi to the panelists and introduce yourself, you are welcome to do it. And we have more guests joining us. Welcome, Andrew. Welcome, Trish. Yeah, uh, maybe if everybody wants to feel comfortable to drop in where you are located right now, where you are joining us from, that would be great. Right in our chat box. Awesome. NYC. We Keep love it. NYC. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago, Cape Cod, Boston, Guatemala. We love it. Jemmy, welcome. Julie, West 29th Street, so close to me. <laughs> oh. Berkeley, California. Well, welcome everyone. We're going to try to be very conscious of time this evening. We know we have many more community members that are going to be joining us um, probably about 10 minutes later or so, but just to be conscious, we'll go ahead and officially kick off. Um, I am Jacqueline, one of the co-founders of Feely. Feely stands for tribe, which is really family and community. We are a female founders mastermind, which is a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship and accountability group. Um, we launched about two years ago to create an ecosystem to help founders succeed through education, resource sharing, networking, and creating pools of funding. So we have a wonderful conversation that we've put together for you this evening featuring ethical and sustainable fashion. And I'd like to officially kick it over to my co-founder, Summer, who will introduce our panel this evening. I know we are so grateful to have Mercato Global's team here as well as their partners. So before we officially introduce what Mercato Global is and the team, I want to say each month we do an event called Active Listening. This event is a public facing and partnered with the good community-based and driven mission-driven companies. So Marketo Global is one of the leading companies we have been following for years. So Marketo Global was launched more than 15 years ago with a mission to transform the lives of women and their communities, making a lasting positive impact. As an international nonprofit, they partner with indigenous women in rural Guatemala and offer them resources and support to become financially empowered entrepreneurs connected to international retailers such as Levi's, Free People, and North Shore. So I really want to mention one data, which is so meaningful and uh, incredible. So last year, Marketo Global provided um, to incorporate high quality reusable face masks into their collections. This has been a lifeline for an entire region where other revenue resources have disappeared. And thanks to their supporters, they have donated 130,000 masks to date to communities in need through the Americas. So without further ado, I would love to introduce the founder of Marketo Global and who is also our moderator for tonight. So Ruth, from overseeing Mercado Global's growth, from a small nonprofit working with a dozen indigenous women artisans in Guatemala's Highlands, to its recognition as an innovator in social enterprise, partnering with hundreds of artisans, Ruth is a pioneer in the field of ethical fashion. Under her leadership, Mercado Global has led efforts to mainstream fair trade sourcing in the international fashion industry and supported in indigenous women across Americas in gaining income and empowerment through access to the international market. So without further ado, I will pass it to Ruth, who will introduce our speakers tonight. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Summer. And hello, everyone. It's so wonderful to have all of you here tonight. Um, we are so honored to partner with Feely to present a panel about a topic that's central to all that we do at Mercado Global, ethical and sustainable fashion. Um, as Summer mentioned, my name is Ruth Alvarez de Golia, and I'm founder and executive director of Mercado Global. And I am just thrilled that some of our most important partners are here tonight, um, representatives of some of the retailers that we work with who are so key to making our model work and to connecting indigenous women in rural Latin America to the international market. And in fact, you mentioned our face masks program um, and we have now officially donated 170,000 masks and two people who have been so, actually several people who have been so key to it. Um, Nada and Jason from Levi's, we're so generous in um, donating uh, about 7,000 yards of dead stock denim from Levi's that we use to make the masks. Um, and Julie from Free People, Free People actually picked up our buy one, give one mask program, which helped us raise the funds to, to finance donating the mask. So, so grateful to everyone that we have on the panel and to all of you for being here tonight. Um, so we're going to have a few few discussions. First, I'm going to inter uh, I'm going to introduce each person who's on the panel, and then later we're going to leave time for questions and answers. Um, so to first introduce Julie, Julie Verdugo is director of sustainability and social impact at Free People, and she's dedicated her career to driving change through ethical product creation and community focused initiatives. She started the sustainability department of Free People after leading impact projects for over a decade with global brands, including Adidas, to nonprofits like the National Park Foundation and Mercado Global, and entrepreneurially with her own jewelry company, Hamela. Her work has led her from factory floors in Argentina and Germany to teaching sustainable jewelry design in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro, to building business strategies on the ground with artisan co-ops in Guatemala, Peru, and India. And she has also led free people to earn impact awards from both Girls Inc. and as of last year, Mercado Global. Julie, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Ruth, I'm excited to be here. Next, we're gonna be joined by Jason McBriarty. Jason is Director of Communications and Operations at the Levi Strauss Foundation where he's responsible for connecting the stories of the foundation and its grantees to Levi's CSR and sustainability initiative. He also serves as a key subject matter expert, providing guidance and input to leaders and departments across the company. In addition, Jason oversees all aspects of the foundation's operations, grants administration, and its $78 million investment portfolio. Jason recently became a mentor with, un with the Unreasonable Group, an organization that supports growth stage entrepreneurs taking on seemingly intractable social and environmental challenges globally. He also serves on several boards, including the Net Impact Corporate Advisory Board and has presented to audiences on corporate philanthropy and CSR at UC Berkeley, Boston University, Babson College, the Aspen Inst Institute, South by Southwest and Influence Nation Summit among others. Jason, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Ruth, I forgot to uh, put in there that I'm one of the biggest Mercado Global fans. I've been since the beginning and I'm wearing one of the jackets. I love it. I love it. It's, it's the collaboration between Levi Strauss and, and Mercado Global. That's right. And that is true. You are one of our biggest fans. We could not do it without you. Thank you, Jason. Also joining us tonight is Nada Grivinich. Nada is the Global Senior Design Director at Levi's, where she helps the organization become a more sustainable and responsible apparel, footwear, and accessories manufacturer. She's an experienced design leader with a demonstrated history of working in the apparel, accessories, and footwear industries. Nada served as the designer in residence for the Rhode Island School of Design, working with art and design students to intertwine fashion and sustainability within product. In this position, she helped launch Fabric Transformation Takes Form, a five-week program with RISD, where students and structures, instructors work together to find new approaches towards the foundation of fashion design. In 2017, Nada served as a Service Corps Ambassador for Levi's and Sri Lanka. Nada, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And last but not least, we have Alyssa Burgos, Mercado Global's Brand Director. Alyssa was originally introduced to our work back in 2016 during her time as the accessories buyer at Stitch Fix, and immediately she felt a deep connection to our brand. 
After working in buying for six years, Alyssa decided to shift her focus to ethical and sustainable fashion. And by May of 2019, we had recruited her and she was working full time out of Mercado Cabal's headquarters in Guatemala. Throughout her time here, her role has evolved to now be part of our senior leadership team, where she uses her extensive knowledge of buying and merchandising to strategically plan out how we design and market our collections for consumers, boutiques, and major retailers. Thank you for joining us tonight, Alyssa. Happy to be here. <laughs> All right, well, let's just jump right into it. So just 16 years ago, when we launched Mercalo Global, fast fashion was booming. And of course, in so many ways, it still is. But no one was really talking about ethical fashion yet. And it was largely unknown, maybe to the, to the general kind of mainstream consumer in the way that it is today. I'd love to ask each of you, how did you discover your passion for ethical fashion? And how did you shape your career path with this in mind? For those who would like to jump in. Um, I, I can start. <laughs> Um, it's interesting, um, you know, I wasn't necessarily looking to um, focus on sustainability when I joined Levi's, but one of the first things that we did, and I'm not sure, uh, Jason, if you were here, I, I believe you were, is we started the Waterless program, um, and I think now it's probably at least over 10 years old at this point, and I forget what the, the number is, but I, I remember at that point it, uh, that it was, I thought it was really amazing that we could make such an impact, because it wasn't just about Levi's making a better product, that actually influenced um, our peers, I guess I should say, in, in the industry, which is uh, a, a, a really an amazing way to make change. It's not just about what we do, but what others in the industry can do. So I remember that that was like a profound change. And then, then, then it's been uh, ongoing ever since then. But I would say that's what, uh, that's what really stuck out when you asked that question for me. From Levi's. Yeah, just, to, just to add a little bit. So the Waterless program sure. um, is a program that uses less water in the finishing process, I mean, making jeans, um, making making apparel, or manufacturing apparel, but making jeans in particular is a very, very thirsty um, process. In fact, one pair of jeans uses about a thousand gallons of water, which is wow. just crazy from cotton field all the way to consumer use. And so that was a little project. You're right, Nada, it started about 10 years ago, 2000, 6,000 units. We weren't sure if it was gonna even um, get any traction with consumers 10 years ago. And now it's in 80, over 80% 80 of our product, the finishing cost. Wow. Jason, I remember being at your office when you first told me about this as a future project that was coming down the line. Mm -hmm. And to hear about the industry-wide impact it's had now is just amazing. Yeah, we share, you know, unlike, um, we don't keep that as a secret, as Nada said. We open sourced it with everybody. And so all of our, we actually even brought our, our competitors into our innovation lab for three days to teach them how to do this process. We sell it at free people and we love the Levi's Waterless. I'm such a fan of it. I was so excited to chat with Thank you guys you. today. I'm like, I love the Waterless. I owned Waterless. It's so <laughs> great. I know our customers love it too. Yeah, we, we could talk Thank about you. that all day. It's fantastic. And um, kind of to chime in on the subject, I mine was a little different. It sounds like than not in Jason's is uh, my, I kind of arrived at ethical fashion more from the like the human side, less the sustainability side, more like the artisan area. And I don't know, I, I grew up in the Midwest where everyone sewed, my mom sewed, my grandma sewed, and it was just like part of the way you, if you wanted to wear something you liked, you kind of made it. And then people started going to the mall and I'm like, why would you go to the mall if you can make it? And it's just sort of like this clash of like mass consumerism and then craftsmanship and where it was really coming from. And traveling internationally at an early age because my dad's from South America I was sort of like starting to see these artists and goods I'm like how come these aren't hitting the market wow there's so much talent or like that looks like that thing I saw at the mall but this looks like the original version of it and starting to connect the dots until Ruth like you said I mean people 16 years ago weren't even really talking about this and it just sort of like led to a series of questions like throughout my career of like where does product originate? Where does the design originate? How did things start to become made that we know of as craft today? And it was really like curiosity. And then actually, I love this, but bumping into Ruth at a, a Levi's event. Kind of oh, that's right. I forgot about that connection. Jason, the, the 2018 or 19 International Women's Day event we did with Levi's. Right. 
That's right. That's right, met Julie. Mm -hmm. It was, it was. And that's kind of when this started kicking off for free people actually. But uh, yeah, I guess curiosity is, is the answer to that one. That's great. And Alyssa, what about you? I know that this was also not your original career path exactly. No, yeah. Um, well, I grew up at like the peak of, I feel like the beginning of a lot of fast fashion. I mean, I was like the fast fashion queen and I, it wasn't until college. I was studying apparel design and merchandising and at San Francisco State. And a big focus was ethical and sustainable fashion. And that really opened my eyes up to it. And, but it didn't really become a passion because like you said, it wasn't like there was a ton of options after I graduated. And so even though that opened my eyes to it, I kind of forgot about it. And then it wasn't until for me around like 2015, um, it was kind of around the, like when the 2016 presidential election started to like campaigning started to kick up. And I think that kind of removed a lot of like blinders I had in my life. And so it kind of forced me to want to be a part of a solution and having learned about the impacts and the consequences of the fashion industry in college, it really made me want to find organizations and ways to continue to do what I love because I do love working in fashion, but in a more productive and solution oriented way. So, and then in 2016, I met Mercado Global and it was just like all the pieces <laughs> fell together and I just fell in love. And yeah, no, here I am. Alyssa, Alyssa took her personal vacation while she was a buyer at Stitch Fix to come visit us in Guatemala. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that was, yeah, that was when it really all like solidified for me. I was like, yeah, this is what I need to do. Well, you know, on that note, obviously for our partner artisans, our partnership with Levi's and Free People have just been so amazing and it's impacting so many women and families in so many ways. Um, you know, and I'd, I'd love to hear about, I know that Free People and Levi's both have some really exciting initiatives going on right now. Um, what are some of the initiatives that you're working on that you're most excited about um, that, are, that are kind of coming down the pipeline around sustainable fashion? that you're allowed to talk about. I was, I know, I was trying to think, let me think if I can. Um, I can talk about one that um, it's uh, public and that I wasn't necessarily involved in it, but um, uh, our, our team was um, from Levi's uh, led by Paul Dillinger uh, was uh, definitely leading the pack. And it's uh, about using a new, um, new material called uh, Circulos. Uh, so it's like uh, making denim for recycled denim. And I'm not going to give it the justice it deserves, but uh, we were super uh, excited about that. I think this has been probably two years or so in, in the making. And uh, for anybody that's probably uh, knows about, you know, it, there's so much with regards to su sustainability and recycling, or, you know, you could take denim and uh, make it into, um, oh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, lining. Uh, um, insulation. insulation, gosh, and our <laughs> building has it. But you know, so there's been a lot of uh, a lot of development, and and it uh, just came out. We just uh, Paul and Lena Murphy just won the award for this particular uh, development. So it's really a, a great way to kind of break down the fibers, but to kind of keep the strength and the length of, of the of the yarns when you when you break down the fibers. Uh, usually, it, it it breaks it down so much that you kind of get a really pilly kind of fiber. Where this is really gives you a regenerative fiber that you can use and then break down again. So we were really excited for uh, the company and for Paul and Nuna for, for all that work over the past couple of years to have this product come out. Great. Yeah, kind of on the same stream of impact focus, like circularity, just like general term of figuring out what to do, how to design into a product that can last longer in its first phase. And also if, you know, how can we extend the life of it in phase one when it's in the hands of the consumer or not even yet, if it's on the cutting room floor? And then once it's a finished product, do we have a solution for the end of that too? So mm -hmm. finding solutions in each of those parts of the supply chain has been really exciting, like just trying to get rid of waste. And we've partnered up recently with uh, Fab Scrap, a really great nonprofit in New York City. And we're actually, we're investing in them. We've, uh, we're expanding their footprint to Philadelphia so that all of our URBN brands can recycle any cutting room floor scraps, dead stock fabric with them and starting to design into dead stock fabric and secondhand marketplace on the, kind of the end of product life cycle. So just making sure that it's 
not hitting the landfill if we can control it. That's, Ruth, so that's what I like so much about the fact that we were able to help you secure 7,000 yards of fabric. That's just yeah. been sitting at a contract facility, taking up space. And, you know, I'd like to think it wasn't going, in, wasn't going to go into landfill, but you certainly stepped in and are, are not only using it to create wonderful and beautiful products, but you're also, of course, helping, you know, the livelihood of, of hundreds, hundreds of women and their families. I wanted to touch on one thing before we get off the subject, Ruth, because I, I know you asked what, what's coming down the pike, what's exciting. And I think sometimes we, we get obsessed with sort of the, the gospel of innovation. And I wanna fall back on just the partnership that we've had with you over the years that I think is really important. And I wanna include Nada in this. You know, We came in as the Levi Strauss Foundation and provided what I would call patient capital, you know, philanthropic capital to help you really um, to expand your operations. We gave you general support grant making for most of it. We gave um, 1.5 million over the last five years, that's 15 right. years, sorry. And that's really largely been for you to, to really help build out your organization. And because yep. you know best, we don't want to put these kind of donor, you know, restrictions in place. So what feels really good is about 10 years ago when we were able to pass that relationship off to the Levi's brand, like, you know, someone like Nada, and because it really, um, it helps to prove that you can also be commercially successful. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many other companies, think about this, you know, many for-profit companies benefit from tax benefits, you know, that, that are given to them. And so in some ways, our philanthropic dollars are like a tax kind of it that we gave to you to help you get off the ground so you could prove your commercial success. And then for me to, to know that Nada is working with you on accessories line just kind of completes the circle. So I'm, I, I love that partnership that we continue to have with you. Totally. And it's so, so exciting in so many ways. You mentioned the 7,000 yards of dead stock you sent us last year. And this month, we're right now is in, in transit another 10,000 yards of dead stock that Jason helped us save just before it was going to go to the landfill. And Nada we had a call with us the other week where we're planning out what we're going to do with it in the in future collections. Um, so it's, it's exciting. Absolutely. Well, you know, on, on that note, one of um, the big pieces to really growing um, the ethical fashion movement is engaging consumers and really in further increasing consumer interest in this. And with the rise of social media, consumers have been, you know, having more opportunities to go behind the scenes and learn how products are made. Um, people are also so much more invested in seeing exactly how retailers are doing business and how, and, and they want to be part of the conversation. I know that each of you are tapped in in different ways to um, consumers who have an interest in ethical fashion. And I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on how have consumer attitudes shifted towards the work that you're doing around sustainable fashion? Um, and what are your thoughts on how best to reach the conscious consumer and make, um, you know, make this a conversation that they wanna be part of? Yeah, this is... Um something that I, it's been incredible watching the past. I mean, as we've said several times, even 15 years ago, this definitely wasn't a top of mind conversation. And so it's, it's continued to progress, but I would definitely say over the past, even just year, all of the momentum in the United States with um, really addressing and calling out like racial inequality, racial injustices, and so much of fast fashion is extremely connected to that um, on a global scale. And so I think, you know, as, as people become more aware of the impacts of their, of how they spend their money. And if you're, if you're so connected and passionate about certain political movements or, or just humanitarian causes, realizing that sometimes how you choose to dress yourself can kind of contradict that. I think now that people are starting to make those connections, um, that's really been driving a, a really big shift. And I mean, I'm not saying that if anybody who, wears anything from fast fashion is like supporting horrible causes because obviously there are you know ethical fashion comes with a, a price tag a lot of the time um but I think seeing that shift has been really um, incredible the past year and seeing how much people are demanding transparency and um like voting with their dollar not just you know every four years and Julie I know this is something you're always thinking about and being a brainstorming partner to us on. Definitely, I mean, it's like, we, our brands exist to please the consumer and to serve them. So if we're not listening to what they're saying and if we're not providing them 
any sort of safe space or feedback loop, then we're not relevant either. It even becomes a business case. It's sort of like, we're not going to be around if we're not listening well. And, you know, I, as much as like cancel culture has gotten really maybe out of control, I'm not really advocating for that, but speaking up, I mean, the, especially the constructive feedback and the specific feedback, there's nothing more I really respect receiving than, you know, all of the emails that consumers send in that have any of these topics in mind. We read every single one. And a lot of times it's even more powerful within our organization than an internal idea. It's like, this is what the consumer wants. Like, we better listen up. If we're not where she's asking us to be or he's asking us to be, like, hurry up. This is a gift that we can hear from them because our future, like, literally depends on them. Like, we can't keep the lights on without serving the customer. So I think, yeah, really agree, Alyssa. Like, the last year has has shed the light on, like, how important it is that our ears are, like, wide open and we're responding based on the feedback and trying to get ahead of it too obviously we don't just want to be playing catch up but yeah listening for sure i think that <clears throat> what's really critical is that you know I, I think corporations in particular will often jump from issue to issue to issue and i think it's important to sort of stake your ground and then stay invested in not just with your philanthropic dollars but to use the, the power and the channels that you have um th that to to allow to allow, for instance, leaders in social justice movements to use to use your platforms, we were able to do that last year on through Levi's or Levi's Instagram Live. We brought a lot of our foundation grantees and from our social justice portfolio on to talk about the importance of voting, not in a non not in a partisan way, but in a way to bring everybody into the democratic process. And it was we heard from those leaders that while they certainly appreciate the dollars that the, that, that we contribute to their organizations. In some ways, having a global brand like Levi's standing shoulder to shoulder with them, supporting their, their mission, supporting their voice was, was somehow even more powerful. Um, I, I wanted to share a resource when you, when you asked about fast fashion and, and sort of consumers starting, particularly younger consumers starting to, to, to really rethink the, their choices. There's a great organization called Remake Our World um, that was founded by a, a, remarkable, a remarkable person, Aisha Barenblatt. Um, I, plug, she used to be my intern when she was in grad school at the Goldman School at Berkeley. Um, but she's created an organization called Remake, Re Remake um, Your World, where she's creating connections between the makers who make products um, and consumers. In, in, and she does it through storytelling, through video. Really, she's done, I think, six videos to date. Very compelling. They're not long, 10, 15 minutes long. Um, Levi, Levi Strauss has brought her on one of our trips to a supply chain community and she, she, she sits down and speaks to the people which are primarily women, over 80% of um, women and uh, apparel workers are women. And it, I think creating those individual stories really helps to shine a light on how products are made and that the decisions, Alyssa, as you said, the decisions that are being made at the consumer level, how that has a huge trickle down effect to you know, most likely a woman you know, somewhere in the world making that product. So you see a $5 t-shirt, there's a price being paid for that somewhere. Exactly. Right. Absolutely. I think another thing too is how interesting that uh, the, I, I would say in the last year, everything that's happened, but I, I, it's interesting um, to listen to the youth, no matter what company you work at, but as an industry to really listen to, to the youth. And I would say, uh, that can be anywhere from like 12 to, you know, early 20s. But but generally speaking, uh, I live with a lot of youth in my house and it's surrounded by quite a bit of it. But it, it's amazing. I think that the power that that uh, demographic has. And uh, I think it's also their response to fast fashion and kind of pushing back on it. Um, their response to whether you want to call it vintage or um, previously owned clothing or uh, recycled clothing, but the, the it's hard to ignore the um, significance of the rise of like vintage clothing uh, yeah. again, and and a lot and uh, you know a, a lot of that is new definitely to someone that's as young as 12, 13, 14 years old. So I think it's more than just oh it's cool, it's something that I might have seen from the 80s or the 90s. It's really I'm doing this because I don't need to buy anything new. Something already exists, and I can take that and use it in the way that was intended, or create it and make it as part of something new and kind of give it a second life. So I think that's kind of really been powerful this past year. 
well, maybe, you know, building on that for young people or not as young people that want to support sustainable fashion and help advance this movement, what do you each feel are the most important things that sustainable conscious consumers can do to help advance this movement in a, in a real authentic way that has impact? I think learn your style first. I think like really taking time to understand what it is that you like or don't like, you know, spend time on Pinterest or learn, learn your style because that really reduces how much you feel you need to consume. Mm -hmm. And it makes it easier to maybe invest in um, an ethical brand or it makes it a lot easier. So in Guatemala, they're called pacas, but it's a, a bunch of secondhand clothes that come from the States um, to Guatemala. And when you go with like something in mind, like you, you know what you're looking for, you, you know, you haven't, like, I swear the sky, everything just aligns and you always find something like it. But it's like, when you go with, with things in, in mind that you like, it also makes it a lot easier to secondhand shop. Um, so if you, you know, if you don't feel that you can invest in um, higher price ethical pieces, learning your style and really understanding what you like makes it a lot easier to um, secondhand or vintage or shop or, oh my gosh, no, um, Oh my gosh, what's it called? Depop and Poshmark, uh, all of those things, it makes it a lot easier. So I think learning your style is a really easy way to um, be more makes conscious sense. with how you consume. I mean, you heard earlier from Julie how powerful uh, the consumer voice can be. I mean, communicate with the companies that you believe in, you know, and do that research. And, um, I, and also just sort of rethink, and I think coming out of, the pandemic, a lot of people have started to realize and understand, do I really need all this stuff that I have in my world? And, mm -hmm. you know, I think Patagonia has been the gold, gold standard when it comes to trying to encourage consumers not to buy as much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Le Levi's recently launched a campaign um, called Buy Better, Buy Less. And we really mean it. I mean, you know, Nadia, you, you, you can speak to this. Um, our CEO, Chip Berg, and our, mm -hmm. our head of Levi's brand, Jen Say, have been asked by reporters, do you really mean it? I mean, do you really believe that you can be successful as a company by encouraging consumers to buy less? And we actually think there's a model that, that will work and we'll do that. But the, you know, the operative part of that is to buy better. So to do the research, whether it's Levi's or Patagonia, or, um, you know, it just, or, or, or free people, it's knowing how that product is being made, not just from an environmental dimension, but, you know, who are the people behind that? Who are the people mm -hmm. in the supply chain making that product? Again, it's most likely a woman, you know, supporting a family. So understanding that and being willing to, you know, sacrifice and pay a little bit more money mm -hmm. for a product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree, Jason. I mean, like, I really, as a as someone who is on the brand side, I, I really don't like to say, uh, I don't like to put the burden on the customer, but as the customer, if you're caring, if you're a conscious consumer, like read up, a lot of brands are greenwashing. You should be able mm -hmm. to get the answers that you want when you're about to buy something. Mm -hmm. If you don't have them and you care, send a note, say something, speak up. But on kind of the other side, like as a consumer, if you are working in a large organization or a small one, also speak up like I think understanding that we all have if those of us working or just you know community members we all have a little bit of power I think a little more power than we think it's like how can we think a little bit differently to change our behavior slightly I'm always like talking to the free people community and talking to people in finance or operations like do you understand that your job is so tied to sustainability it's not just in design it's not just in the sustainability department it's like and that job, you know, that ops position outside of fashion, like if each person applied their questions when they were consuming to their questions within the organization they worked in, I think it comes back to the point around curiosity and research, but I find a lot of curious people ending up in the sustainability space. So it's like the people that like to ask questions, like say those out loud, write them, put the questions out into the universe. Well, you know, on, on that note, um, with the, the last big recession, the, with the global recession, I remember one of the things that happened that we saw with consumer behavior was that we actually saw so many of our, so many of, um, our consumers and the consumers of our clients 
really seem to become more interested in conscious consumerism during the recession that I think the global recession unlocked an empathy among more consumers that we personally hadn't seen before. Um, and it created these really big opportunities coming out of the last global recession for us. And we feel that we've seen the same thing during the pandemic recession. Um, and it's really fascinating, even just this season, you know, for us, we've launched with all these big new retailers, including ShopBop. And um, it's, so, it's so exciting. But I think one thing that we're thinking about, as I'm sure all of you are thinking about, is, you know, the, the crystal ball. What are things going to look like after the pandemic? There's, there was such an outpouring of empathy in so many ways, charitable giving, um, other type, you know, maybe not empathy everywhere, but also a lot of empathy in some places during the pandemic. And I'm curious to know what each of you think um, the future for sustainable fashion, you know, holds um, as we pivot to the next phase um, of, of the economy and of the fashion industry. Just a little question. <laughs> well, I I think, you know, one thing that I think we've all probably experienced is we all wanted to be a bit more comfortable while we were staying at home. Um, so I think it, even though we're coming out of the pan pandemic uh, or parts of the world are, some some parts are still obviously still in it, which is unfortunate. But I think there's a, a, a level of like that uh, the idea of comfort um, and combined with, I think, uh, sustainability or, again, like I said before, um, utilizing something from, from the past and, and giving something a second life, um, which ties into, you know, um, uh, buy better, you know, so something can live longer, which is interesting. Something, at least for Levi's, something that's, you know, vintage Levi's or something that have been around obviously for decades. But I think that that sense of like, you know, comfort will still exist, even though we, we're going to get into a, a new decade and, and not a new decade, a new um, you know, it'll, it'll be a new day, so to say, going mm -hmm. forward. Uh, but I think, you know, if you think of, uh, if you looked at the history of how, how the world changed after the Spanish flu, for example, or the, the, the last pandemic, you know, you, you had the roaring 20s, so to say. So there's definitely going to be this energy to go out and travel and, 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 and do all that. But I think, um, I think there definitely has to be a sustainable impact to all that, uh, just with regards to, to water, um, and just things like just, uh, the, the amount of, um, fuel just on, 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 on a plane. My, my sister is a flight attendant and just started doing trips back and forth to London. And she said, um, most of the trips average 10 people on a flight on the way back. They have more staff, more flight attendants than they do at, at times that passengers. So I think that's, yeah. that's, uh, just so challenging. You know, uh, it's like, you know, on one hand you're, you're glad she's working or that, you know, there are people that have jobs to go to, but on the other hand, what a, what a waste of energy and, and, and time it just makes you really think. I uh, I think it'll make us really think uh, how important is it that I do this and that I do it now and 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 you know what's what's your impact in in the world. So that was a very long and broad answer <laughs> from my point of view. That makes sense. Yeah, I think it's similarly like a re like a, a sense of reevaluating values in a way that I think consumerism fits into that where a lot of us have slowed down our consumerist tendencies and we sort of realize like not a to your point about comfort like maybe some of us used to fulfill like a need for comfort with like buying something new and like the yeah. new look and I think we kind of a lot of us have done away with that I mean we've seen I've seen a preview board I've seen the data like that's not how they're shopping anymore and it's kind of nice to know, and I, I hear stories of people, you know, being reunited with family and friends, and it's like, that's what life's about. Like, of course, clothing is so important. That's why we're all here in textile and celebrating it, but sort of like, what is the piece? And Alyssa, back to your point about like, what's your personal style? Like, what's the thing that helps you tell your story? But beyond that, like, I don't think we need that anymore. So I hope we can all carry that with us. Uh, there was an article in this, in the Atlantic Monthly this week that was saying that this this global pandemic, despite the tragedy that it's 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 really bestowed upon too many people, and particularly marginalized communities, both here in the United States and, and abroad, particularly women working in the apparel sector, um, it, it's a chance for many people with privilege, I would argue, to reset to, to kind of start to, to kind of get a chance to start over, and just think things anew. It's it's the same as what we've heard, you know, Julia and Nana have said, and I find that. Like 
owning a lot of stuff can be stressful. And so now I'm going to really think about what are the pieces that I want? Like, what are, what, what has meaning to me? Like this, you know, this Mercado Global jacket that I showed at the beginning of the call. I mean, this jacket has a lot of meaning to me for a lot of reasons. Um, it's actually where I met my, my current partner um, at a Mercado Global event who thought that this jacket was, was nice and wanted one. It took her two years, but she finally got one recently. Um, but I'm, it's, it's really going to cause me to evaluate what's important to me. You know, certainly relationships first, but then what are the things that I want in my world and what kind of meaning do they have? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can I completely agree. I think that this is something that once um, your eyes are open to the impact of how you spend your money and it's really difficult to disassociate that and it's really difficult to forget that how all of your behaviors can essentially contribute to a cause that you really don't align with and you really you really don't want to contribute to. So I think that as um, as organizations, as Levi's, Free People, Patagonia, Mercado Global, continue to educate the consumer, I think that it's there's not really going to be any turning back. And the I don't know, is it what generation is it that's in like elementary school right now? That's not Gen Z, right? Well, whatever generation is just growing up. I think they're I mean, calling it so generation. What is it? C for Co the C for COVID generation. Oh, well, they're, they're going to be so, I'm, I mean, I think that, you know, they're growing up in a time where, I mean, think about how much, at least for me at 32, I feel like my, the past, you know, couple of years, I feel like I've just learned so much and they're growing up learning that. So their base level for expectations and their base level for, um, what they're, what they will and won't settle for is going to be really, um, really high. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what that generation does. But in the meantime, I, I don't, I don't think any of this is going to slow down. I think it's going to keep on, keep gaining momentum. Absolutely. Well, and as we go into the, the bright new day, um, as the pandemic hopefully winds down in the U.S. and hopefully soon globally, um, what are some of the new innovations in the ethical fashion space that each of you are most excited about that you think could help build better opportunities for expanding the impact of ethical fashion and expanding the prevalence of ethical fashion going forward. That's a big one, but I'll take a stab. I mean, I, I think Jason, you mentioned like innovation, you think of like new and maybe going to tech. And there are a couple of things that excite me in that space, but I think kind of the, one of the biggest learnings that we're taking with us definitely at Urban Inc. is kind of the, the intersectionality of it all and not looking at sustainability as an environmental impact and only looking at CO2 and water when we're talking about sustainability, but we talk about what I think everyone on this in this discussion is really passionate about is how humans fit into this and, and protecting marginalized communities when we do talk about sustainability. So this like intersectionality of it all, like they're not two different subjects, they're one. And when we're coming up with a sustainable solution, how does it impact the marginalized people around it? I think this is becoming a norm, which really excites me where you don't just hear about like a simple carbon offset and that's it. You're starting to hear about these more rounded, robust, further reaching initiatives. And I know that, you know, that's the way we're approaching our work now. We've got a ways to go for sure. And like Alyssa, when you mentioned like, Levi's and Mercado and Patagonia and throw free people in there, like we've got a ways to go and I'll be the first one to say it. So thank you, but we're not there yet. And we're very much on the path of like, do the work before you can like get any sort of glory. But uh, the intersectional side of things is, is what excites me. And that's something we're working on. Oh yeah, go ahead, Alyssa, you could. Um, this isn't anything that I'm remotely, so I'm my designer or our designer, Fernanda Jung knows way more about this than I do. Um, but it's so, in, it's so exciting when you see, when you start to research all of the innovative, um, textiles that are coming out that are the repurposing of them and, and textiles that come from regenerative, um, uh, materials and there's, so that's really exciting to me, but I don't know a ton about it. I think my, um, my expertise is a bit more in like the analytical side of things. And for me, there's a lot of really cool softwares that are out there that are helping to like connect circular brands. Um, like, so 
circular fashion designers with the circular materials, with then how to close the loop with recycling it and how to help educate the consumer. And I think that it's, to me, it's really, you know, it's really easy for maybe a new entrepreneur or a new brand to want to do that, but having those resources to really help facilitate it and really help make it happen, I think that's that's really exciting because it's going to make it easier and easier and easier and less daunting of a of a task. And the more we can encourage that, and the more we can um, try and like fast track more brands to be that way, I think is really so. I'm I think it's just so. I mean, I have no idea how they do it, but it's so it's so um, inspiring and really awesome to me that there's more and more of those um, companies popping up. And Nada, I don't know if there are any innovations you're excited about, but I just wanted to share a story that for me was exactly how I think innovation in the space should happen, which was that you and I um, took a walk and we sat down on a bench and we're trying to figure out how could we build an, ex you know, a product partnership with Levi's that's really sustainable and can really grow working with you know price points and all different factors and you came up with this idea of Levi's had all this dead stock denim that they didn't know what to do with and couldn't get other factories to work with and we don't have minimums we're happy to work with dead stock denim and that was the the birth of this collection that we're actually we this week we're shipping the sustainable accessories collection which combines the dead stock denim with the artisans handwoven fabric which looks amazing um and we're so excited about it but like to me that was it was just i think it was like a one hour walk sitting on the bench and yeah. we came up with that idea yeah. you know what and sometimes it's like you know when you, when you you know uh, when i listen to that question and i'm like always like thinking like for like i think a larger answer but sometimes it's something small like that. And that, that was, you know, one small idea. And, you know, now here we are a year later and you're delivering it and now you got 10,000 more yards. So that's, you know, save 10,000 yards of fabric uh, from being a landfill. Um, and, you know, on another small scale, I shared that with you, Ruth, that in Italy, uh, one of our merchant leads in Italy also put together a program parallel to Mercado Global, a little bit different. It, it um, it is employing about, uh, I want to say a dozen uh, refugees uh, to Italy that happen to have like sewing skills. And uh, our uh, our colleague in Italy put, put them together with seconds, like product that you actually can't sell out, put in the selling floor. So they've got seconds that they take apart and remake into new product. And we've been selling that at our retail stores. So again, small idea, but um, it's been really, you know, like uh, the, the reaction to it has been really uh, phenomenal uh, again in 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 a in a in a larger way than the amount of product that we actually sold. So it's it's more about the idea of yes, it's sustainable, but on top of that, it's really helping uh, a group of people uh, be able to contribute their skills in, in a way that supports not only the company but also supports their livelihood in a brand new country because they're uh, I believe they're um, they're refugees. I forget from what yeah. country, but it, it you know there was no going back. Uh, it was so it was, it was you know again very powerful. Again, it's helping a dozen people, but can you, how can you multiply that across other countries or, you know, so that was again, a, another small story and it's been about, been around for about a year or so also. So absolutely. We're happy about that. Well, I want to give the audience um, a, a moment to have questions as well. And I saw that we had a question about how can someone purchase one of the amazing jackets that Jason is modeling and actually um, we just shipped a whole new shipment of fabric to Levi's tailor shops all across the country. So every Levi's store in the U.S. that has a tailor shop in it where you can customize um, you can customize your Levi's mm -hmm. jeans and tr trucker jacket with fabric, you can choose from several Mercado Ball fabric options. You could copy Jason's amazing design or you could create your own design. So mm -hmm. I encourage, encourage everyone to check out the Levi's store in your city. Um, and one of our fashion advisory board members, Julie Ko, has um, a really great question. She asked, we're talking and, and making better decisions and buying better, but how, as many of the companies that ha have to answer to boards and stockholders, how do you help them reconcile that with the fact that they need to buy less? How do you balance that? Yeah, I think that's such a good question. And I think as much as sometimes this is the part of the business or this is the part of the industry that I don't like, but it's, I mean, you just point to the future generations and say that this is what the future, the future generations care about. And so if you want these future consumers, you also have to be demonstrating it in a very authentic way, but there's also other ways to make money other than just saying, don't buy more. It's, it's 
I mean, you're seeing a lot of luxury brands doing secondhand, selling secondhand now. Secondhand is a huge market and there's so much um, improvement. There's so many improvements that can be made there. So that's something that I think a lot of brands can get into in a way is like, how many times can you sell a product? Because you can, secondhand is something that I think we really need to make a bit more accessible and easier for people to do. So I, um, in my opinion, I think that's a really big opportunity for um, a lot of yeah. big companies with stock holders. <laughs> I also think it's taking the long view. I mean, we, since 2018, have been a publicly traded company. For most of our 147 year, 148 year history this year, we have been privately held by descendants of Levi Strauss um, himself. And so, you know, we were around when slavery was around, during the Civil War, during Jim Crow, the Spanish flu, world wars, depressions. And we've survived all of that as a company. And, you know, the leaders will, will say that it's because we've been on the right side of history on a lot of these issues. And so when we were doing our, our roadshow to sell our, our stock to institutional investors, um, we were traveling from New York and Boston and San Francisco and, and London, and our CEO was asked, Chip Berg and our CFO, Harmeet Sin was asked, you know, you, you all invest very heavily in your communities. You have a lot of environmental sustainability initiatives that cost money. You're going to continue to do that. And Chip res responded unequivocally, yes, because this is a long game. You know, it may cost more in the short term. But we're going to be on the right side of history, which is is the right thing to do from an ethical perspective. But we also feel like it's good for our business. And again, 148 year history, we stood the test of time through all of those. So, no, Julie, that's a. Of course, you would ask that question. I know Julie. I've been in Guatemala with Ruth and Alyssa and Julie, and I'm just like, of course, like the smartest, sharpest question, the hardest one of all. And that is, I think, probably all of us on this call are that's kind of our job is like internally to advocate for it. And I I'm like, it's my job to put together a business case that protects this. And Jason, I mean, yeah, it's a long-term business case. And sometimes you get low hanging fruit that's short term. And sometimes mm -hmm. you even get a cost savings if you're going sustainable. But Alyssa, to your point, secondhand marketplace is kind of where we're focusing right now. It's just sort of like we're doing some internal stuff that will be public soon, I think. And um, that's where we're sort of like, it doesn't need to be a new product. We don't need to create more to keep our revenue going. And that's kind of where we're at right now. But I, you know, I, I just commend and look up to you, like Levi's and Patagonia, who can outwardly say, buy less, like keep this for a long time and stop buying with us. Buy Levi's, but buy, just buy one. I think that's awesome. Yeah, our head of design, our VP of design, Paul Dillinger, Design innovation will say, you know, if you get a stain on, let's say you spill a glass of wine on your jeans at a party, you know, you, can, you don't have to wash them right away. You can just look at it and say, hey, this is, that was a great memory that I had. You know, I'm going to keep that on here. <laughs> so by not washing your jeans, you don't have to, you know, it keeps them, it lasts longer because every time you put something in the dryer, all that little lint, that's part of your jeans. So it'll last longer and then you, you know, you buy less. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, another question that we have from the audience is, you know, how does this all influence packaging? How do you think through both having packaging that is not having a neg negative environmental impact or minimizes the negative impact? And also, how do you communicate what you're doing around sustainability through packaging? Oh, this is... That's a big one. one. That's, a big that's, one. that's a big one. Worse, <laughs> we have not figured that out 100% yet. Yeah, it's a big yeah. one. I don't know. We phase it out. Like, we're sort of starting, we were kind of starting from zero, I'd say. And we've invested, you know, I think like many large corporations, you invest heavily in the supply chain that you have that you didn't really know was full of all this wasteful uh, errors at the time that it was decided on. So, we have certain machines that we realized, oh, we can use recyclable materials on these machines, cool, but there's limitations of, it still has to be a plastic film, but let's now choose recyclable, a recyclable plastic film. So right now we're in the phase of, we've converted all of our packaging to be recyclable, and now we're trying to get to the biodegradable. So it's just, it's phased out for us, and it's something that we try to, you know, Oof, it's it's my favorite and my least favorite topic because it's such a big one. It is such a big one. And right now we're in the process of uh, Urban Outfitters. We got a, a partnership going with Trex. They're, they do a composite deck where basically they recycle. It's a transparent recycling where it goes into a, a composite deck material. 
all of the packaging. So we're trying to roll that out across all the brands. And I see that as like still phase one, not, not the best solution, but a solution, but it's hard. And, and Jason and Nada, Levi's does so much when it comes to sustainable fashion. I mean, when I think of ethical fashion brands, I, as, we, as many of us have said on the panel, I think Levi's, Patagonia, um, you know, think of Levi's as leaders, but how do you, do you incorporate that into packaging at all? And if so, how do you, how do you um, package that message to consumers in a way that sticks where they understand the scope of what Levi's is doing in this space? I'll leave the question to the product person, but I, I have an opinion, but I'll let not an answer it. <laughs> And in the, in the way that we do packaging is it's I um, parallel with the teams that do packaging, but I'm not really responsible for it. But I can tell you from what I have been involved in, I don't have the statistics at, the, at my fingertips, but um, I also am over designed for Signature and Denizen, our um, opening price point um, brands that you see like Target and Walmart. And I know that we just did, uh, we just did a, a whole, uh, reboot of, of the packaging, um, one to clean up the aesthetics and the look of it, but also to take a look at what is really needed and what isn't, you know, like, you know, you have, you can have like five pieces of packaging uh, on, on a pair of jeans and you do, do you know, do you really need that? Or if you're have worked in, I used to work at Ralph Lauren, if you work at men's shirts, I remember like even back then, like you, you could have 11 pins <laughs> on a shirt and the plastic collar and the tissue and all yeah. these things, but it's sometimes just taking, um, you know, look at one thing and maybe you can only do one, one thing if you can remove the, the pins or you can remove the, the plastic stays. Or I believe in uh, what we did in uh, Signature and Denizen is uh, we tried to eliminate some of the like uh, size rolls that uh, for each uh, gene, the way they, they would create all these size rolls and we're able to eliminate it down to like one and just print it at the, at the time that, that's needed in production versus having all these uh, various sizes and you know therefore like eliminating all this waste so it's not something necessarily that that you could speak to the consumer and say we eliminated it was an, an, an enormous amount, amount. I, I couldn't believe it myself but it, it, again it's something small and I think to the consumer it's almost like I think they expect that at this time it's like it's if you talk I think you have to be careful how you talk about it because it's expected versus something that, that you need to say here's all the sustainable things we did it's almost expected that that it that it is there and that's one thing we're very cognizant of when we're um, when we're looking at footwear, which is uh, incredibly challenging to make sustainable, uh, there's brands like Allbirds and uh, th that are I think doing a great job. But you know, if you can at least take components and then try to continuously improve upon those components, being more sustainable, um, parallel to like packaging, I think um, at least we are trying to do that. And of course, materials are sustainable, but it's like it's it's almost how much do you need, and you can you get to the point where Maybe you don't need any packaging. Maybe there's a way to have a digital something. You know, if it's online, you don't need any packaging. But if it's in a physical store, you don't need it. Maybe uh, uh, it's a digital display on a wall or something of that nature. So something to think about. Eliminate it all. <laughs> That's what I think about <laughs> packaging, period. <laughs> Um, well, we're um, getting short on time here, Jason. Is there anything you want to chime in about when it comes to, I know that a big part of what you do is thinking about how do you communicate the great work that Levi is, is doing? Um, you know, what, what are Levi's thoughts when it comes to how that's communicated to the consumer and making the scope of what you're doing understandable to the end consumer? Yeah, it's really hard. It's conversations I've had with our retail team because, you know, first and foremost, our retails, our, our store, you know, our store folks are charged with selling product, right? And yeah. educating them appropriately is always a challenge. I, mean, I know with Mercado Global, like the first time we, we actually launched an accessories line, I remember the, the president of retail didn't even want to put anything about who you were as a company because he, he wanted the product to stand on its own mm -hmm. um, to, to say that this is, this is a great product and we don't want to tell the consumer about you know how it's made the connections to to, to Guatemala and and, and co-ops um, women-led co-ops. I actually would argue now that consumers demand it, so we have to figure out the right balance. It's it's a total it's a complete challenge, particularly when it comes to packaging or retail store or, or telling those stories. Um, you know we do a lot of storytelling on our blog. We're getting our you know our social media Instagram live sessions. Where we're able to share some of the work that we're doing. Got to get Mercado Global on there. But it's, you know, I'll just say it is a challenge. 
you know, to, to really distill it down to what are the most important um, um, stories to share with consumers that, that are compelling, yeah. um, that, that don't compete with those the product's attributes, the primary attributes of, you know, price, quality, and so forth. That's mm -hmm. a challenge. Right. Well, it's, a, it's an exciting space, and it's exciting to see how far the industry has come over the last 10 years. And then, of course, the, we have so much farther to go, but um, I think there are a lot of exciting things going on. And I just want to take a moment to thank each of you, Nada, Jason, Julie, and Alyssa, for taking the time to share with everyone your career experience and your knowledge on these topics. It's wonderful to have the chance to speak with everyone. Um, and Feely, thank you so much for hosting this panel. It's partners like you that amplify our work and our partner artisans. It truly makes a difference to have your support with these really important conversations. Um, thank you. Yeah. And, and it's exciting to see so many uh, people here who are excited to participate in this conversation. And for those who would like to learn more about Mercado Global and our work, we have a very special Fiesta campaign that we launched this past weekend that's coming up. We have a big virtual event, June 15th. It's our annual Fiesta celebration. Um, so please you know, contact us, let us know if you'd like to get more involved, but there's lots of ways to get involved. Oh, Ruth, and uh, yeah. thank you so much, Ruth, for bringing everybody together. And uh, we're just grateful for all of you here doing the work. You know, Julie, Alisa, Nada, Jason, we learned so much. And I just want to mention uh, your team, Bryce or Carrie, if you can pass the information about the festival on June 15th, so we will make sure we blast it out to our community. And also, I know some of our Philly members here, like uh, Katie Fink, she's a retail executive and the fashion, uh, no, and the marketplace entrepreneur in the wellness space. Katie is all about sustainable, uh, sustainability. And also Cassel, who is our Philly tribe here, his magazine talks a lot about sustainability. And our friend uh, Miao here, she's doing fashion technology entrepreneurship. She's launching a SaaS business to help the fashion industry to produce less. So everybody here who want to get involved more with the uh, Mercado Global, we're happy to forge the relationship for, for, for you ladies and gentlemen. And I will pass it back to my co-founder, Jacqueline. Thank you so much. Summer, you just echoed everything I wanted to mention. So thank you for that. We can't wait to further connect with your community, find ways to support, join your June 15th celebration. Thank you to our speakers. Ruth, thank you so much for moderating that fantastic conversation. We appreciate everyone. If you liked being a part of this community, we would love to welcome you back for more of our Feely Tribe events. You can check us out at feelynyc.com. Thank you all so much and wishing everyone a fantastic evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.